Hi, my name is Alexandra and I'm a bibliophile. Welcome to A Lovely John, where we talk about literature. Today's episode is going to be a little bit different. Normally I focus on a single work and do an in-depth analysis, um, and then I also have some lecture style videos that talk about literary theory as well. But today we're covering a topic that was requested by Corners of a Bookshelf, which huge thank you to her. She pointed out that my previous video, that I, one of the videos that I uploaded, um, was not complete, and I really appreciate her willingness to point that out so that I can fix it. Um, and I'll leave her channel link in the description as well. Uh, she wanted to follow up on a topic that I brought up in my channel trailer, which is basically asking the question, what are the cultural implications of Twilight? Now, this book has been discussed, loved, hated, reviled um, for, a, for a long time. Um, it's obviously was really popular, was made into a film, and it's kind of a passe topic at this point. But I felt like uh, since she asked the question, I'd go ahead and jump into what my opinion is. Um, and I'm going to give an even bigger disclaimer on this video than I have sort of over my whole channel. It, while I do have a degree in English, and I will be looking at the literary aspects of this book, um, it, some of what I'm going to talk about is going to touch on sociology and psychology, which I have no expertise in whatsoever. Um, I'm just going to be giving you my ideas and some of my thoughts on the book. That's all it is. Um, so, as always, do your own research, form your own opinions. If mine seems like it's true or it correlates to something else that you've learned and you have more expertise in it, or if I'm way off the mark, do let me know down in the comments. Um, and I think this is a really interesting point for discussion anyway, so hopefully we can continue the conversation there. But again, these are just some of the thoughts that I've had when thinking about this series. Alright, so I'm actually going to start off with the definition of the purpose of art, according to me. Again, this is another topic that's really open to interpretation and discussion. Um, I do make art, but I've never taken an art degree and I've never really thought about studying the philosophy part. But here are some ideas around the topic that I think might be true. So I've noticed that among many other things, art performs this dual role of reflecting and dictating to culture. So it reflects the society that it's made in. The artist living in a particular culture in a particular time, having imbibed the ideas and the aesthetics of where they are, um, produces work that is inevitably a product of that society, of that environment. And this may be done consciously or unconsciously. Um, but art also dictates to culture, as viewers, readers, whatever, imbibe that form of art, listeners, um, it, they, they take in the ideas that it represents. And, you know, broadly, in broad strokes, art can represent an ideal for us to aspire to, for us to attempt to achieve a goal for us to work toward, but it can also show us our flaws. It can teach us how to avoid them. Um, and now, one way that art can be bad is when it is a reflection of our flaws, but it's cast as ideals, it's represented as ideals, and as something to be admired or emulated. So that's kind of like a definition that I want to set out from the beginning as we start to pick apart how Twilight works. So how does Twilight reveal something that is going on in our culture? Let's sort of start with the genre. At base, I think Twilight is a romance novel. and we kind of have to ask your question, well, what do romance novels do? Romance novels are created almost exclusively for a female heterosexual audience. They narrate a simple story, so the, the simple story is the same even though the characters and, and the settings and the situations sort of change, and obviously there's variety in that, that's why, you know, multiple books within a genre are published, but basically it's the female protagonist falls in love with a dangerous and or usually and powerful man and the process of them falling in love is a narrative about her civilizing him and ennobling him and that he becomes in this process somebody who's actually worthy of her love um, and Twilight follows that narrative pretty closely um, and the purpose of these books is kind of to satisfy the desire of the reader to hear that story told and resolved over and over again that's why so many of them are published, so many of them are consumed. They're not usually rereads, they're usually, you know, uh, uh, you go and you get another one, the next one, even though the framework for that novel is pretty set, 
um, you, you hear that story over and over again. Um, fantasy, Twilight is also a fantasy book, so let's talk about what the fantasy genre does. Um, and it's particularly an urban fantasy. We have supernatural and fantastical creatures living side by side in a realistic setting, sort of incognito. And the purpose of fantasy fiction is to create these fantasy creatures and environments and worlds in order to investigate the deeper realities of humanity. So basically the idea is that by removing the trappings of realism, which can be distracting, which can be details that actually hide truth, um, depending on how the author uses them. So by removing these trappings of realism, the work seeks to get at a deeper truth about humanity. So let's talk a little bit about how vampires in particular have developed um, over the course and kind of do this within the fantasy genre. So I think what's particularly interesting about vampires is the way that the um, vampire narrative has metamorphosed over time. Originally, you know, the vampire is this like strange, bald-headed, pointy-eared, creepy old man creature that, you know, creeps in at night, they're parasitic, their desire starts and ends with blood, they seem to be particularly interested in the blood of a young attractive woman, hopefully a virgin. So in this original narrative, we have the female victims of the characters that are sexualized, um, not the vampires. Um, of course, with, we have like the piercing of the neck, we have the vampire's kiss, there's sexual imagery there, but again, it's the male vampire who's satisfied and this, you know, it's almost always this bosomy female whose like dress is kind of falling off, who's victimized and sexualized. So you can see that there's a real different audience intended for this version and this original narrative of the vampire. Over time, um, the vampire has transformed, you know, they were always a conscious being, they were always intelligent, they were always um, able to make plans and communicate and all of those things, and in many ways had human intelligence. But they were transformed into, you know, kind of a self-conscious, a self-aware being. Um, and previously, they didn't have too many metaphysical questions about why he was the way he was, what his role was in the world, it was just like, I want to suck your blood, right? But this inner questioning is definitely the product of the interview with a vampire by Anne Rice. So that was really the hallmark of this shift where we sort of go into the inner workings of the mind and the moral quandary of what it is to be a monster. And again, this is fantasy working out what fantasy works out. is like by extrapolating evil onto some foreign creature and then making it human and dealing with the moral questions that we all have to face as human beings of like, how do I... I have a capacity to harm other people, I have a capacity to lie, cheat, steal, murder, whatever. How do I deal with that within myself? Um, and so the, question, the line of questioning basically goes, if the vampire is conscious, then is he self-conscious? If self-conscious, then is he moral? Um, and how does the vampire deal with the reality of what he is? Um, and it's also with the rise of these metaphysical questions that we find the introduction of female vampire characters as well. Before that, it was just like this weird like male predator character, right? Um, and, and again, as Nick, I already said, this is the, the fantasy genre doing what it's supposed to be doing. So Twilight's vampires. So the vampires in Twilight's have pretty much already settled this question of the inner morality of the beings before the story even starts. They eat animal blood to avoid the problem of murder. Done. But a bing, but a boom. So this is settled early in the first novel, even in the time before the novel starts, uh, which means that the fact that Edward is a vampire doesn't actually mean very much. It, what remains is the fact that he is dangerous and powerful, which puts him in line with the romance genre. So Twilight doesn't do much with the fantastical elements it introduces. It serves a shorthand to get to that powerful and dangerous love interest archetype. It also doesn't do much with the, real, with the um, werewolf element. With this, um, when it's introduced, we could have you know questions about uh, who their identity is in the midst of the pack. Is free will you know true or? Do but we always sort of controlled by these outside forces, including peer pressure or the cultural forces around us. But we don't really get any of that question anymore, this investigation. It's just shorthand to introduce another dangerous and powerful alternative love interest. Um, so, Twilight is YA. The third category that Twilight exists in is young adult fiction. Now, young adult is not 
I'm gonna say something that a lot of people are gonna disagree with, but I'm pretty sure that this is true. Young, ad young adult is not a genre distinction. It is a marketing distinction. You can tell because it tells you about the reader, it doesn't tell you about the book. Um, or, in other words, it's telling you about the intended audience. In other words, it's telling you about the market that it's trying to reach. Um, the other way to tell is that you can have all kinds of genres within young adult. You could have a mystery, you could have a coming of age tale. So coming of age, a lot of people talk about young adult contemporary, really what they're talking about in terms of genre terms is a coming of age story. Um, and you, you could have a western, and you could have all of these same genres for children or for adults or for teen readers, it doesn't matter because that's a genre distinction. It's telling you about the content of the book, it's not telling you about the intended audience. For the fun, young adult is telling you about the intended audience. Um, but what's interesting is that this is a relatively new category. Uh, so like when I was growing up, I got to read a lot of really great children's books and also some I read some crappy ones that were just really fun to read and very entertaining and that's great. I read Nancy Drew, the Redwall book section, if you guys read those but cute animals in a monastery with like delicious food, it was awesome. Um, I, as mentioned, I read like all of the Saddle Club books. I was a member of the Saddle Club, you're welcome. I read Narnia, I read a million other books and they were great. Um, <laughs> When I was really little, I was particularly susceptible to the marketing ploy where like a little trash key was included with the book, like I, like a little charm bracelet for the that the character had who helped her do her ballet performance when she remembered her grandmother from the charms or whatever. I had a necklace that went with like this uh, ice skating book and it had like two figure skates in the pendant. I uh, totally thought that was the greatest thing ever. Locking journals, oh my gosh, it's all about all about the stuff. I was their target market. I made my parents buy it. It was successful. But I was also the Harry Potter generation. And what Harry Potter did differently than most of the other books that I read uh, was that Harry Potter grew up and the books grew up with him and with me. While Redwall, Nancy Drew, Sat Saddle Club, all of these were episodic. The characters never grew older, the world never really changed, they never really matured, they just went on new adventures, and the characters more or less remained the same, um, and almost existed in this, like, timelessness. Harry Potter represented a series with an overarching plot, and an overarching storyline and progression, both for himself as a character, for the narrative as a whole, and that matched, obviously, with, like, my age as I was growing up, and then the books became you know, bigger, darker, more difficult to read, more complex, dealing with more complex questions. Um, and so in that process, it transitioned from a pretty classic children's book to something that's, it wasn't quite that anymore. Um, nowadays it would probably be considered middle grade, but again, that was a term that I feel like did not exist, or at least if it existed, then only publishers talked about it, and I had no idea that they were talking about middle grade books. Um, and uh, when I like went to the bookstore, it was like, yeah, there's a children's section, and then they had this one, like, half a shelf that was called, like, Developing Readers or something, which was probably middle grade slash YA, but it wasn't really its own designation. It was just, like, all of the genre fiction. Um, but anyway, <laughs> uh, so, like, Harry Potter kisses a girl and he has a girlfriend. On the other hand, Bella has, like, teen boys, like, sleeping in her bedroom overnight and, like, breathless makeout sessions. So there's definitely, like, a a differentiation there, and the distinction between middle grade and young adults seems to be how explicit the sexual content is, um, which again proves my point because that means that it's cueing the parents who are trying to be gatekeepers about what kind of content they're allowing their children to read. So that's another reason why I think that distinction is important. It's important for consumers. It's not important for like what type of story it is. Anyway, <laughs> between Harry Potter and Twilight, we've you know, kind of carved out this new designation and lots of floor space uh, for bookstores. And Twilight really normalized and introduced teen readers to what is essentially the romance genre. From there we have, you know, the development of Fifty Shades of Grey, Grey which as I understand it was originally published online as fan fiction of Twilight and it follows, you know, it has the same structural pattern, but of course they all have the same structural pattern because they're romance novels. Uh, so we have this precedent of pretty explicit sexual content wrapped up in romance narrative. And um, these stories narrate a particular kind of relationship based on dominance and danger to an audience who is still figuring out how to have romantic relationships. And these types of relationships are set up as the ideal to be achieved. You know, Edward is this like amazing 
wonderful, like the guy, desirable guy, right? So let's go back to my definition of bad art at the beginning. Bad art is often the reflection of the flaws represented as ideals. So it means it takes the flaws of our society and instead of saying like, hey, these are the things that we should be avoiding, which art can do, um, it's setting them up as something to be admired and emulate. And that is exactly what Twilight does. And I think that that's why I would define it as bad art. Um, so in this case, the flaw that is represented is the idea, ideal of being in a romantic relationship with someone who's dangerous to you. Now, being attracted to someone who's strong is not a bad thing. You, especially as you mature, you want to be married or in a relationship coupled with someone who is capable of saying what they want, who's capable of compromising, who's mature, and all of those things take strength. Um, but being attracted to someone who has a very strong desire to murder you or to physically harm you and gets a certain amount of sexual pleasure from it or predatory pleasure from it, that is a, obviously a dangerous precedent to set up for a relationship. Um, and so in Twilight, we're representing that particular problem as an ideal to be emulated. Um, so overall, Twilight sets a low standard and makes it acceptable. Um, even from writing style and construction, you know, I would say that the quality is fairly low. Um, and according to my personal definition of art, which you can feel free to disagree with, lots of people still, we're still kind of figuring out what art is anyway, it doesn't matter. Um, but for my definition of art, it completely fulfills the definition of bad art. Um, and as a result, it has made it completely acceptable cont to continue publishing works, works that are on this same low level. And that's really a shame. So, you know, is there something intrinsically wrong with reading young adult fiction? No, there's not. Um, and especially, you know, even if you're not the target market or you're a grown person and you enjoy reading the stories, a lot of times they're really fun stories and a lot of them are a lot better than Twilight and have quality to them. But at the end of the day, most young adult fiction kind of is there to be entertaining. And that's a wonderful reason to read. That's not a bad reason to read. But I would say that it's kind of a shame if it's the only thing that you're reading and you're not growing beyond that. Um, there's nothing wrong with saying, like, oh, I just read for fun and for pleasure and that's what I want to do. That's fine. But you're missing out on an opportunity to grow and become a better person, a more intelligent person, and a more mature person through the aid of literature. And that's really what art and literature is for. It's to help us to be better people, more humane, more mature, more loving and giving good. Um, and now the whole part of that dialogue between art and culture, between the artist and the audience, is figuring out what those ideals are to be emulated, what those flaws are to be avoided. And when you have, you know, essentially bad art that's mixing those up, it muddies the water in that discussion, and that's a very important discussion to have. It's sort of the, the key of the humanities, and that's sort of the key of human culture. That's what we're all, we're all fearing for. So, um, anyway. <laughs> Just a light discussion on Twilight and my philosophy about the meaning of the world and what we're all here for. Just, you know, keeping it cool. Uh, but anyway, I really appreciated that, that question from Corners of a Bookshelf. Like I said, she's a booktuber as well and she has a channel, I'll link it down below. Um, and I hope you guys enjoyed some of the ideas that I brought forth. If you think I'm totally bonkers and it's nonsense and you should just read for fun, feel free to spam the comments. Uh, if you have any questions about it or you have alternative ideas about what makes good art or like why it doesn't matter if things have to be artful, that's totally fine too. I would love to continue the conversation and hear those variety of opinions that are out there because that's, that's the point. That's the point of this um, investigation of this life is to go into the world of ideas and sort of assess which ones are true, which, which ones are wrong, which ones are, are good ideas to pursue and we can go from there and be, be better people because of it. Anyway, <laughs> my name is Alexandra, and I'm still a bibliophile.